But uh, I'm Dave. I get to be the pastor here. And happy Easter, everybody. The Lord is risen. This is, no, no, no. Someone like, yo! And others, he's risen indeed. Okay, let's, 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 uh, let's do the liturgical version. He is risen. There's a, an Anglican who always needs to... So they think they know more Latin and stuff, everything. Like, and now for those who just kind of like, let's have a party. He is risen. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Awesome. I love, I love, like, have, you, have you noticed that we changed the clocks this morning? So this service is even fuller than, I know some of you come to the first service and now you're here. And you have to stand in the back, potentially. Like, <laughs> that's good. Hey, this is our, our greatest Sunday in the year, isn't it? It is our great, it's, it's the Sunday where we throw our hats in the air and we raise our glasses. If you haven't done that already, we do that after the service again. And we say, a toast to the risen king, long live the king, hip, hip, hurrah, and everything, right? But that's what we do. And uh, because of this event, because of this Easter Sunday, it's the greatest thing that not just happens in our calendar, it's the greatest thing that happened in history. It's the very event that split history into AD and BC. Like, I know it's Christmas, but Christmas only has meaning because of Easter, right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's because of this Easter morning, Jesus is the most important person that ever lived on the face of this planet. More songs have been sung to him. More art has been painted of him. More books have been written about him than any other human being who ever lived. And that's our worship. Uh, and that's, our, that's our savior. That's the one who we get to honor and worship today. So I'm glad you're here for it. If this is your first time here, I love that you're here. Welcome. Hope you feel at home. And uh, maybe you're asking, yeah, 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 I know this is something Christians do. Like, <laughs> we've got to celebrate Easter once a year. But what's this got to do with me? And I just want to share for a few moments just some thoughts on what the Easter story actually has to do with us. And I'm going to start somewhere completely different. Um, how many of you love animation movies, like Pixar or like these kind of things? Show, show you how. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, my favorite uh, uh, animation movie is actually just a, a Pixar short, a short film uh, called Jerry's Game. You know it? Jerry's, is it Gary or Jerry? I don't even know. J Gary, Jerry. So Jerry Game. It's a short film, 1997, I believe. It was it's like a long time ago. Um, and it's just, uh, how, how many of you have seen it? Just show of hands. If you haven't seen it, don't do it now, but later on on your way home, just go on YouTube. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, I think it's five minutes long, so you can watch it. It's hilarious. So there's a story of this old man uh, who goes to the park in the autumn, and he plays a game of chess against himself, because all of his friends appear to be gone already. So he's a bit of a sad character. So he plays this game of chess against himself. So he always goes around the table, and he takes on, over the course of the game, he takes on two personalities. One is very confident, and the other one's very timid. And the confident one seems to win the game, but then at the end, the, the timid character of him uh, seems to uh, uh, have an idea, and he fakes his own, his, his, his own heart attack. <laughs> and whilst the other guy is worried, uh, in a split second, he turns the board around and finds himself in the winning position, and he wins the game, and that's made this movie win an Oscar, okay, for, for best animation film in that, in that year. Uh, it's a hilarious, uh, hilarious story. It's been said throughout the centuries, people have been said, life is like a game of chess. Have you heard of this? Like, some of you are going, like, life is like a game of chess. I don't know how to play a chess. It makes sense. I don't know how to play life either. It's frustrating. <laughs> life is overwhelmed. Life is like a game of chess in the sense of you always have to think about your next move. What's my next move? How can I be three steps ahead? Um, how can I avoid unintended consequences? How can I avoid feeling cornered? It's like a game of chess. And uh, in, in chess, if you know the rules, even if you don't know the rules, you probably know that the, 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 the goal of a game of chess is you, you move your pieces around on the board and you are trying to uh, protect your king. Because if the king loses, you lose the game. You have to protect your king and you're also at the same time trying to corner the other king. And when the other person's king is running out of moves, it's called a checkmate. I'm running out of moves. I am cornered. No more moves left. No more hope for me. I've lost the game. Checkmate. Yeah? And that's how the game ends. I want to show you another uh, uh, um, image on the screen. And this is from a painting from a German artist called Moritz. What's his name? I've never heard of him before. Moritz Retsch. Moritz Retsch. Anybody? No? Good. I can just make up stuff about him. So, <laughs> well, now I do know. I've Googled it. <laughs> 19th century, he was in Dresden. But he painted this. I came across this as I was preparing for today. And this... 
uh, painting is called Checkmate. And it is this, um, you know, it is this, this image of what, what he perceives life is, that there's, there's this man who is playing a game of chess against the devil himself, and there's an angel watching, but it seems like the man is losing the game. And uh, the, the, the devil is just watching things happen, and it's like, okay, I've got you cornered. I've got you in the corner. The enemy's closing in, and uh, he, he's already captured a lot of the pieces. And for some of you, this is what your life feels like right now. That it feels like, man, the enemy is closing in. Like, it's, I'm not just playing this game to survive life. It feels like I'm playing against this, this guy who outsmarts me, this enemy who's, who's not on my side. He's against me, and he's cornered me, and he's closing in. And it feels like I'm... I, I'm at a checkmate position even. Maybe that's what it feels like for you right now. Some of you, you are in a relational checkmate position right now. And because your marriage was already hanging on by a threat, but then she found your browsing history, and now it's checkmate. Some of you, you have a, a financial checkmate uh, because you were already trying to, to, to pay the bills, and it was already tight, and then you got laid off at work. And now it's a financial checkmate. Some of you, you have a, a, a physical, like a health checkmate, where you have uh, tried so hard to stay healthy and tried to just like, I got to be strong, got to eat healthy, got to be fit. And then the doctor told you that the cancer has spread. And it's like a physical uh, checkmate. And we can find ourselves in our lives in these positions where it feels like I'm cornered. The devil is up against me. How do I get out of this? I'm out running out of moves here. Checkmate. Anybody knows what I'm talking about, right? Thanks, a couple of you. Yes, I think all of us know this feeling super well. And um, it is, then, it is an, an impossible situation where it seems like there's no way to get out. If this is where you're at right now, I'm glad you came to church today. I believe God brought you to church today because I came here to tell you that the moment Jesus walked out of the tomb, the word impossible was forever eradicated from our vocabulary. When it seems impossible to you, it's not impossible to him. So maybe you want to write this down. If the tomb is empty, anything is possible. Actually, say the second part of the sentence with me. If the tomb is empty, anything is possible. Say it as if you want it to be true. If the tomb is empty, anything is possible. Okay? If, if the tomb is empty, if Jesus is alive, if our sin is paid for, if death is defeated... If the devil is overpowered, think about this, then our chains can be broken. Our addictions can be cured. Our sickness can be healed. Our marriages can be restored. Prodigals can return home. Sin can be forgiven. Grieving hearts can find comfort Broken hearts can be repaired in Jesus' name. If the tomb is empty, anything's possible. So I want to look with you now at the Easter story in Luke chapter 24. If you have your Bibles, open your Bibles in Luke chapter 24. Some of you got a piece of paper on your chair as well. You can read along there or on the screen as well. Luke chapter 24, and let's look at the Easter story, how Jesus turned his greatest tragedy into his greatest victory. How Jesus turned his checkmate, the king was running out of moves, into his greatest comeback. You with me? Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, if you've been around here for a while, I want you to read along the white words, okay? On the first day in the morning, very early in the morning, the women took the spices. Those are the original Spice Girls. Okay. <laughs> it's good, come on, it's good, it's good. It didn't really work in the German service. <laughs> but it's good. Come on, let's try again. Okay, so the spice... <laughs> on the first day of the morning, very early in the morning, the, the women took the spices that they had prepared, and they went to the tomb. If you were here on Friday when we read these, um, the, the passion story from the book of Mark, you know that the women were the last at the cross, and here we see they were the first at the tomb. Where are the guys? Where are the guys? The women are there. So it's, it's a story about... Jesus and them mostly here. And it says they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed, or that gleamed like a lightning stood beside them. Later on, we find out these were two angels. Okay, they stood there, and in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Let's pause here. That's a very good question. Why do we look for the living among the dead? It's a sermon for another day, but it's so often we try to find life in things. Things or in places that are actually lifeless. Have you noticed this? Uh, I, I need to preach about it some other time, but I, I want to say to you, you will not find the life, the fulfillment that you are looking for in salaries, in status, in sex, in positions, in success. You will not find it there. You will find life when you give your life to the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And that's Jesus. That's where you find true life. Why do you look for the living among the dead? What are you doing? And then it continues in verse 6. Uh, he, he's not here. <laughs> he has risen. Remember how he told you. Remember how he told you. Uh, do we have it? Yeah? No. Next, next slide. Next slide. There it is. No? It's coming. Oh, it's gone. There it is. Okay. So he, he's not here. He's risen. Remember how... He told you, yes, he told you uh, that when he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified and on the third day be raised again. In other words, what they were saying is there is no other way. This, this had to happen. This had to happen. There was no way around. Why? Why was it? Some, some, that's a question some of you have asked. Why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't God just forgive us our sins? Come on, he's, he's, an, he's a capable God. Why does he not just forgive us our sins? Why did he have to sacrifice his own son? That's a difficult question. And let's just be real about it. For God to forgive our sins, I'm going to say this really respectfully of him, but that's probably been one of the trickiest things for him to do. Because he found himself stuck in a, in a dilemma that he is a just God and a loving God at the same time. So where is he going to lean? <laughs> Justice or love, you know? The justice, like he's a just God, which means that the guilt of our sin must be paid for. Otherwise, it would be unjust. But he's also full of love. So how can he ask for justice without ending us? And so his way out was, I'm going to pay the punishment myself. I'm going to pay the guilt, the, 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 the depth, the, the, the weight of sin. I'm going to put it on myself. And that's, that's why Jesus had to die. And so when Jesus was you know, handing himself over to be laughed at, to be um, mocked, to be flogged, to be nailed to a cross, to be hanging there trying to catch his breath by pulling himself up on these nails, and down there was the mop. Mocking his appearance as he's hanging there, split naked, and uh, and they were they were betting which one of the three of the cross would be the first one to die, and he was hanging there shrieking in pain. And then at some point, it says he pulled himself up for one last cry, and he cried out, "It is finished." He didn't say, "I am finished." He said, "It is finished." And the thing that was finished in that moment was sin. Finished. Guilt. Finished. Shame. Condemnation. Finished. It, it wasn't the end of him. It was the end of sin. It was the end of guilt. It was the end of shame. It was the end of condemnation. What looked like his greatest tragedy was actually his victory. He won in that moment. And so the women... They didn't understand this. They knew that Jesus had died. They didn't understand why Jesus had died. And so the angels are saying to them, remember how he told you. He's told you about this. We're, we're, we're surprised you're surprised. We're shocked you're shocked. He's told you about this. How in the world did you miss this? Like, seriously? Like, you know, because in, 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 we read in the, in the Gospels that throughout Jesus' ministry, again and again, he told his followers what was about to happen. He pulled them to the side, it says, and he said to them, like, here's what's about to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. They're going to really, um, like, hurt me, and then will kill me, and I'll be buried. And then three days later, I will come back to life. Just, I'm telling you now, it's not going to be pretty, but 
be prepared. I'm warning you. Like, I'm, I'm preparing you. I'm, I'm, I'm announcing to you what is about to happen. He's, he's several times he's told them, but it says again, they did not understand what he was talking about. And so here the angels are saying, like, remember, how, he's told you this. How in the world did you miss this? The, we just came from heaven. The angels, heavens, they are roaring right now because Jesus has defeated death. And we thought you guys would be down here, maybe outside of the tomb by midnight, 10, 9, 8, 7, you know, like counting down, Jesus is going to come back out of this tomb any minute. How in the world did you miss this? We're shocked, you're shocked. We're surprised, you're surprised. You know, and, and we smile at this a little bit, but as a pastor, can I just be real with you? Here's why that bothers me. Because maybe you want to write this down. Here's what that means. It is possible to hear all the things and miss the main thing. Think about this. It is possible to hear all the things and you miss the main thing. It is very possible because of this to be around Jesus and to know stuff about Jesus and to do things for Jesus and you're still not getting it. If you've been around Mosaic for a while, most of you, you're here almost every week. If you've been around Mosaic for a while, you, you know the drill. You know how we roll here. You know all the things. You know we never start on time. <laughs> we start late, and then, um, and then we sing three songs, <laughs> sometimes four, sometimes two. We sing some songs, and then there's some announcements, and then I come to preach, and, and, and then we sing another song. We pass buckets through the rows for your contact cards and then we'll, we'll end the service at some point and then we go for lunch and, and, you know, and, and you know exactly how it works. You know when to stand, when to sit, you know the melodies, you know when to raise your hands, when not to raise your, you know. Some of you, you've even learned already to clap on two and four. That's good, you know. The others will be gracious with you, <laughs> you know. Some of you, you know to take out your phone at some point while I'm preaching just to take a picture for your Instagram and just go, Pastor Dave's killing it today, you know. <laughs> Fire, 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 praise hands, praise hands, praise hands, you know. <laughs> what happened to you? Seriously, what happened to you? You've been churched. That's what happened to you. You've been churched at Mosaic. And you know all this stuff. And maybe it's even emotional, but it doesn't mean that it's personal. Because it is possible to hear all the things and miss the main thing. What is the main thing? At Mosaic, here's what we believe is the main thing. That Jesus, the Son of God, became one of us, lived a sinless, perfect life, and then he took our sin upon himself, nailed it with himself to the cross, then he was buried. Three days later, he rose again, and he is alive today, and he wants nothing more than for you to get to know him so that he can change your life. That is the main thing. Amen? <laughs> and everything... And, and, and if, if, you, if, if you focus on all the other stuff, you can miss that main thing. All of the other stuff is just things that are supposed to point to that, not to distract to it. Okay, let's keep reading. Um, in verse 9, here's what happened. So the, the, they talked to the angels, and then they said, let's go back, tell the others. So when they came back from the tomb, do you see it? Verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11. There's no, you know, uh, Judas was no more. So it's like 11 disciples left. Uh, and all the others who were there. Uh, and it also says, here are the names of those who actually had gone to the tomb. Um, Mary Magdalene. It's, by the way, this is mentioned because <laughs> these women were still alive when this gospel was written. So it's kind of like, you can ask them. Ask Mary Magdalene. Ask Joanna. They, they were there. They saw the angels. You know, this is kind of eyewitnesses here. Uh, Joanna, the Mar Mary, the mother of James. And then they forgot all the other names and the others with them. <laughs> who, <laughs> who told this um, to the apostles? But then it says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Nonsense. I want to talk to those of you who are in the room. Maybe you're new to church or maybe you're exploring Christianity and you're kind of, you're, you're intrigued by it, but you also have loads of questions. And some of you, you come to this space, to this Easter service, and you have some doubts about all of this. Like, really? Is that, like, do we really believe this? Uh, and I, I want to say to you, if you have doubts, you'd make a good disciple. Because these disciples were full of doubts as well. Okay? Don't think, oh, disciples are people who no, have no doubts. 
You know, you, you can have doubts and still be a disciple. Jesus is not scared of your questions. Jesus is not scared of your doubts. In fact, one of the prayers that I believe you can pray, that he loves to answer. I want to challenge you with this. If, if, if you take nothing else, take this. One of the prayers you can pray that he loves to answer is, Jesus, if you are alive, would you show yourself to me somehow? I think he loves that prayer. and He loves to show himself to you. Jesus, if you're really alive, I want to know. Show yourself. To me. Reveal yourself to me. Okay? Jesus is okay with your doubts. I actually would say, a faith that cannot be doubted is a faith that should not be trusted. A faith that cannot be doubted. It's like, don't ask too many questions. It's a faith you shouldn't trust. Okay? So ask your questions. And maybe you are saying, I, I can't become a Christian quite yet because I still got questions. I still, I still have some things that I still need to figure out, and, and so I can't really say that I have faith yet because I can't explain this. Listen, faith does not mean that you, ha you can explain everything and you have no more questions. If that's what faith is, I don't have faith <laughs> because I still have questions and I can't explain everything, okay? Maybe you want to write this down. Faith is where the unexplainable meets the undeniable, You get it? Faith is where the unexplainable meets the undeniable, where you say, this does not make sense in my head. I don't know how to explain this, but I cannot deny it. I cannot deny this thing that I had experienced with this risen Jesus. I cannot deny that he's changed me. I don't know how it happened, but I know that it happened. And also, I cannot deny the 2.4 billion Christians around the world today who also celebrate Easter because they say, Jesus has changed my life today. I cannot deny that. I can't explain it. But I can't deny it. Make, make sense? So faith is where the unexplainable meets the undeniable. The reality of the risen Jesus surpasses that which we are able to understand. It surpasses our comprehension, what we know to be true. Maybe you're saying, yeah, okay, but I am a modern person. <laughs> Uh, back then, the people were a bit more primitive, a bit more simple. I'm an educated person. <laughs> Don't expect me to believe the resurrection. I can't believe this today. Listen, it's always been hard, not just today. It's always been hard that Jesus rose from the grave. It's always been difficult to believe that Jesus was resurrected. The idea of a physical resurrection sounded just as ridiculous to the disciples who heard the women with their report than it sounds to us. Okay, so it's always been hard to believe. Yet maybe they're, you know, maybe they didn't, maybe they were more primitive in the sense of they didn't know what bacteria were or electricity and these things. But it's not like their IQ was 50. Okay, so like they, they had a mind to think as well. And so the disciples also could not believe it until they saw him themselves, until they met him. And in the Bible, in Luke chapter 24, a little later, we read that um, they were all together. They were hiding behind locked doors, maybe because of fear that they would be next, that they would also be crucified. They were hiding. They were fearful. And then Jesus just kind of, like Harry Potter, he just walks through the door. I don't like, like just, just, you know, the door was locked. He just shows up, you know, hello. And he says, actually, what he says is not just, boom. He says, uh, shalom. Which we know, that's a greeting in, in the Middle East, in, in the Israel, that people greet themselves with shalom. It's like, good day to you. But I believe for Jesus it was more than that. I believe Jesus was um, speaking something into their lives in that moment. I believe Jesus was coming to them with the result, with the plunder of the cross. Shalom, which means peace. It means forgiveness. It means celebration. It means Wholeness, it means reconciliations. Like, I love that that was Jesus' first word to the disciples was shalom. Look what I've accomplished. Peace with God. At last, it's yours. Shalom. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, shalom. Shalom. Yes, awesome. And the disciples, they were like, okay, what is happening? Am I having a hallucination? Are you seeing what I'm saying? I, I, I'm seeing, and they, it actually says that they thought they're seeing a ghost. Are you seeing this? This is a ghost. And I love how Jesus is so, um, so tender with their doubts. Even in that moment, he's already there. They still can't believe it. And he's, he's not saying, how dare you question my sovereignty over death? Like, I told you this would happen. Like, I'm so disappointed. No, he's not saying this. He's actually saying, okay, you still struggle to believe. Look, in verse 40, he says, he showed them his hands and his feet. 
which is not just hands and feet. We know the hands and feet of Jesus, they still had the scars from the nails. He's saying, like, look, it's really me. It's not even Jesus' uh, twin brother who just looks like me. Look, it's really me. I was the one who was on the cross. And look at my side. And, and, and he's showing them the marks of his sacrifice. Real love bears the marks of sacrifice. And he's showing them. It's like, don't be afraid. Have a look for yourself. Touch it. Touch it. It's, it's, it's real. These are, these are not marks of tragedy. These are marks of victory. And by the way, did you know when we go to heaven, we will see Jesus the way they saw him? Like we will all be renewed, new bodies, like no more sickness, no more brokenness, no more scars. Only one person in heaven will have scars, and that's Jesus, who in heaven, it says actually, he, he will look like a, a lamb that was just slaughtered. Like just, he's going to carry these scars for the rest of eternity, proudly, because what they accomplished was shalom. You get it? Okay, so he's showing them the hands and his feet, and then... Why they still did not believe it because of what? Because of joy and amazement. Do you have it? Sorry, I'm not, no, it's not there. Let's put up the verses again. Um, while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, and this is a little funny now, do you got something here to eat? <laughs> I haven't eaten in three days, actually. I'm a bit hungry. And, uh, and he just said, I'm going to prove to you that this isn't a hallucination. I'm going to actually eat in front of you. Because that's what real people do. And, and, and so, do you have got something here to eat? And I, I'm just imagining, they're just scared, uh, staring at him. It's like, yeah, ca- ca- uh, you know, fetch the fish we cooked earlier. And there's some, some broiled fish, apparently. And they're just kind of like handing it to him. It's like, here you go, Jesus. And then they just, you know, he starts to eat in front of them. And they're just uh, staring at him with their mouth open. It's like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? This is Jesus. He should not be here. And I love this. I love that. Well, you know this. In, in, um, in ancient cultures and also in some cultures, some of your home cultures where you came from uh, today, is um, eating together is more than just sharing a meal together. It's actually sharing friendship together. You know, Jesus is saying, like, I'm not just a hallucination. I'm here because I want to be your friend. I want to eat with you. I, 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 want, I want to be this close to you. And... Um, in the context of relationship, of friendship, then it says that he started to explain things to them. He's eating the fish. They're staring at him. Can you imagine it? And he's like, let me explain to you how this actually connects with the Old Testament. You know? And he opens the scripture with his mouthful and just kind of explains things to them. How all the laws and the prophets and the wisdom literature, how it all connects. And he's actually saying, yeah, all of this actually connects to me. Guys, do you get it? Like the law connects to me. Uh, because I hope you see this now. Like, I, I am the high priest. I am the sacrifice. I, I am the lamb. Like, that, that's about the law. And, and, and the prophets, it's all about me. I'm the suffering servant. I'm the son of man. I, I am the judge. That's, that's all about me, uh, the Messiah. And, and, and the Psalms, even. Like, I, I'm the good shepherd. It's, it all points to me. And it, it says while he's eating and explaining things to them that their eyes were opened and suddenly they were connecting the dots. Suddenly, it all, like it was like a light was switched on. And it says in, the, in Luke 24, it says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And I think there's a point in here that we only understand the Bible. We only truly understand the things of God in the context of relationship with him. You cannot n- know this without knowing him. Okay, so I believe what Jesus wants to do on this Easter, is he wants to invite you to a friendship with him. Let me go back to how I started this message, and I'm coming into land here. Let's go back to this painting that I showed you from this German artist uh, called Checkmate, Game Over. Uh, I found out that for years, this, this painting was actually hanging in the Louvre in, in, in Paris. Did I pronounce it right? Louvre, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> How do you say it? Where the Mona Lisa is, that building. Okay, okay. So, as you can tell, I don't know that much about art, but still, it was there. And I know now it's someone, a private person owns it, just has it sitting in a living room. But uh, it was hanging there for years, and there's a story that maybe it's a legend, maybe it's true. I just share it as if it's true because I like it to be true. There's a story that this painting in Paris was. Um, taken and and hung up when there was a convention of all the world's greatest chess players. They had a gathering in Paris, 
And they thought, oh, let's get that chess painting from the Louvre and hang it up while they're having their dinner. And so it was hanging there. They were gathering. They were talking about chess, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. And there was one, one chess player who was just fixated on this piece of art. And he was just staring at it. And it was like this, you know, and he, he looked at the board. And then he tried to re, uh, like reconstruct the moves on the board. I don't know how you would do that, but if you're a master chess player, I guess you can do that. And uh, so he, he was staring at it, and he, he started to get more and more uncomfortable with the painting. And then he called a curator over, and he said, I have a problem with this painting. It's like, yes, sir, Why, what's, the, what's the problem with the painting? He said, either the title is wrong or the board is wrong. The title of the painting is Checkmate. Okay? Either the title must be changed or the board must be changed. Because he's saying, I'm a master check player, a chess player, and, and I've looked at this board And I think I know the moves that were made. And it, I know the guy in the painting, he thinks he's losing the game. But what he does not seem to know is that his king has one more move. His king has one more move. And actually, this one final fatal move will turn the whole game upside down like Jerry's game. And will make him the winner and the enemy the loser of this game. I was like, well, what does that mean? No, just trust me. The king has one more move. Guys, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say this. The king has one more move. Come on, go, say it. The king has one more move. We're at the end of a series. Over the last few weeks, we were in a series that we called The Unusual King. And I want to tell you today, in the name of Jesus, I want to tell you today that Easter is the declaration that our king always has one more move. Okay? Our king, you can go for this. Our king always has one more move. That is the story of this book, by the way. If you read this book, you'll find this again and again. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel were in the desert, standing at the sea in front of them, the Egyptians coming in behind them, closing in. And it seems like they were going to be defeated or going back into slavery. But, say it with me, the king had one more move. Oh, okay. The king had one more. You really got to come with me now, okay? Okay. But the king had one more move. Later on, the people of Judah, they were exiled in Babylon, and it seems like it was all hopeless. But the king had one more move. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, and he was expected to be eaten for breakfast by these lions. But the king had one more move. In the New Testament, we find a woman who was caught in adultery. And she was dragged in front of all the people, half naked or maybe fully naked. And they were about to stone her. But the king had one more move. The disciples, they were in a storm. And they thought, we're about to, we're about to drown here. But then Jesus came on the water because the king had one more move. There was a criminal who was crucified next to Jesus. And he messed up his entire life. And he thought, I'm going to get what I deserve, this kind of shameful death, and then I'm going to burn in hell. But next to him was a king, and this king had one more move. And he said, you're going to be with me in paradise today. Paul and Silas stuck in a prison awaiting execution, but the king had one more move. Guys, Easter is the declaration that the enemy has lost the game. Okay, the enemy has lost the game and you may feel like you're in a place right now in your life where you are at a checkmate. You've been cornered. It's like, there's no way out. I am running out of moves, but your king has one more move. Maybe in your finances, maybe in your relationships, maybe in your health, maybe even in your spiritual life. Because you're feeling like my prayer life feels like I'm going to the, the tomb of a dead person. And you know how sometimes to cover with your grief, you're talking to a dead person just like to keep a conversation going, but it's like, you know, he can't hear you. That's what your faith maybe seems like right now. It's like, I'm just talking to a dead person, but you forget that the king has one more move, even in your spiritual life. Everything in your life can be different if you would just put your life into the hands of this unusual king we've been talking about who wants to offer you today friendship. And I want to just close, the, the band can already come up. I want to just close and ask you a really personal question. You don't have to share it with anybody, but ask yourself and be real with yourself. 
Where do you stand in your relationship with this Jesus that we've been talking about today? Where do you stand in your relationship with Jesus? I want to give you four letters on the screen. And maybe you can self-identify yourself in one of those four letters. It's very kind of general, but maybe you'll you fit into one of those four categories. And, and, and be real with yourself. Don't, don't, don't just give the answer that you think you should give in church because like, oh, okay, we've got to all be Christians here. You know, give a real, don't give the answer that maybe your grandmother wants you to give. Be, where, where are you at right now, today? The A maybe says, uh, if, you, if you're an A, you're saying, I'm already a Christian. I believe this. I know this king. He's changed my life. I trust him. I follow him. Not perfectly, but that's my choice in life. My commitment is to walk with him. Maybe you're an A. Maybe a B is where you're saying, I want to begin a relationship with this Jesus. Today's the day. I don't want to go to bed one more night tonight without having made this decision to invite this Jesus into my life. I want to begin a friendship with Jesus. If that's what's available to me, I'm going to say yes to it. Maybe that is your decision today. Maybe you're our C and you're saying, I'm gonna, I need to consider it more first. Uh, give me some more time. I'm curious. But I got a whole lot more questions. I need to think about this some more. I'm not quite there yet. That's great. Mosaic is actually a church that exists for people who are in category C. <laughs> Because we want to give space for us to just explore Jesus together. And you take your time with it. And you can come to things like the Alpha Course or a small group or just keep coming here on Sunday. Consider it more. Maybe you're saying, I'm a D. D means I don't ever intend to go there in my life. Most people in Berlin are a D. Uh, it's not, it's not, they're not just not really interested in it. Okay? And maybe, maybe that's where you're at. Like, just be honest. I respect honesty. I think it's... It, Unfortunate, I think it's unfortunate, but I respect your honesty if you're saying I'm a D. Let me go back. If you are a B today, I want to give you opportunity right now to invite Jesus, King Jesus, this unusual king into your life and become his friend. And what you can do very simply is I'm going to pray a prayer right now and we're all going to bow our heads. And in your heart, you don't have to say something out loud, but in your heart, you can just pray along in your heart as well. As I say these words, You just echo them in your heart. You're saying amen to what Dave just said. Well, Dave, that line is my prayer too. And you make it your prayer. Is that okay? Can we all bow our heads? And if, you wanna, if you're in category B, you want to begin a friendship with Jesus today, just pray this. Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. Say this in your heart. I know I'm a sinner, which means I try to find life in dead places. Today, I want to say I believe it. I believe that you died for my sin. And I also believe, even though I can't explain it, but I believe it that you rose again so that I can join you in new life. Today, as much as I know how, I receive this free gift of salvation. I want to begin a friendship with you. In the days, weeks, months, years ahead, show me what that means. Show me what it means to follow you. Amen. Amen. Why don't we congratulate those who prayed this prayer right now for the very first time. Amen. Come on. Woo! That's incredible. Yes. Awesome. Now, here's one thing I would encourage you to do. If you've prayed along right now and you meant it, uh, don't, don't walk out without telling somebody. Maybe you want to share with the person next to you. Maybe someone invited you to come along. If you don't know who to talk to, come over, talk to me. Or there's also some people over there, Casey and, and Ruben and the prayer team. You can come, go to them and just tell them and they can bless you. Also, if you've got other things in your life that you want prayer for, you can go over while we sing some more songs. Uh, we want to continue to worship King Jesus, the risen Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to stand and let's make some more noise for Jesus. Amen.